It was the design of Angelo Ricci and John Zanuck and Manuel Silva to call on the terrible old man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on Water Street near the sea and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble, which forms a situation very attractive to men with the profession of Mercer's Ritchie, Zanuck, and Silva, for that profession was nothing less dignified than robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man, which generally keeps him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. Ritchie and his colleagues, despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode. He is, in truth, a very strange person, believed to have been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day, so old that no one can remember when he was young and so taciturn that few know his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stones, oddly grouped and painted, so that they resemble the idols of some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard, are to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles, but there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folks, who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes. These folks say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles, in each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string, and they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis, and that whenever he speaks to a bottle, the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations as if in answer. Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo Ritchie and Joe Sasnick and Manuel Silva were not of Kingsport blood. They were of that new and heterogeneous alien stock which lies outside of the charmed circle of New England life and traditions, and they saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless greybeard who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. They were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular fellow whom everybody shunned, and at whom all the dogs barked singularly. But this is his business, and to a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a talent, but a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank and who pays for a few necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Messrs. Richie, Sesnick, and Silva selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. Ritchie and Mr. Silva were to interview the poor old gentleman, while Mr. Sasnick waited for them in their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street by the gate in the tall rear wall of their host grounds. Desire to avoid needless explanations in the case of unexpected police intrusions prompted these plans for a quiet and unobstinious departure. As prearranged, the three adventurers started out separately in order to prevent any evil minded suspicions afterwards. Messrs. Ritchie and Silva met in Water Street by the old man's front gate, and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of the gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about than mere idle superstition. They feared it might be unpleasant work, making the terrible 
infirmal old man Lucatius concerning his hoarded gold and silver. For aged sea captains are notably stubborn and perverse. Still, he was very old and very feeble, and there were two visitors. Messrs. Ritchie and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling persons voluble, and a scream of a weak and exceptionally vulnerable old man could be easily muffled. So they moved up to the only lighted window and heard the terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles and pendulums. Then they donned a mask and nodded politely at the weather-stained open door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Sasnick as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted and he did not like the hideous screams that he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the day. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Very nervously he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivy-clad stone wall. Frequently he consulted his watch and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing where his treasure was hidden, and had a thorough search become necessary? Mr. Sesnick did not like to wait so long in the dark at such a place. Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the wall inside the gate, heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow of the single dim street light, he strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house which loomed so close behind. But when he looked, he did not see what he had expected, for his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man, leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Sasnick had never before noticed the color of that man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in little towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talked of all that spring and summer about the three unidentifiable bodies horribly slashed as with many cutlasses and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel old heels, which the tide washed in, and some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found at Ship Street, or of certain especially inhuman cries, probably from a stray animal of migratory bird, heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was by nature reserved, and when one was old and feeble, one's reserves is doubly strong.